It's shaping up to be a huge spring for Korean authors. Jung Yun's Shelter is garnering tons of critical attention. Han Kang's The Vegetarian I'm seeing everywhere, and her follow-up book, Human Axe, is poised to be just as big. And of course, there's Alexander Chi's The Queen of the Night. Houghton Mifflin Harcourt was kind enough to send me a copy, which I was only too eager to dive into, if only to save James Patterson from being eaten. Voracious reader extraordinaire Liberty Hardy has threatened to eat James Patterson if the Queen of the Night doesn't do well. And frankly, that guy looks a tad gamey. So, edible authors aside, let's talk about the book. Alexander Chi notes in his acknowledgement that the first spark of this story came from a chance encounter with the late David Rakoff. I've always considered him a Canadian David Sedaris, and I loved his book Fraud. Anyway, David's in the East Village when he meets Alexander and proceeds to tell him about Jenny Lin, otherwise known as the Swedish Nightingale. He refers to her as a 19th century Cher who traveled across the United States doing her farewell tour with P.T. Barnum. Alexander Chi imagines this opera singer on a train performing at a circus at night, but on doing a little bit more research, he finds his imagined Jenny Lin has nothing in common with the real woman, but then he finds that he likes his version more, and thus starts the story. This is a huge operatic novel. The writing is opulent. It took me a little while to actually find my level in this story. I mean, this is literary romance meets historical fiction, which is a couple streets, if not an entire county away from my usual wheelhouse, but I found myself settling nicely into the story, this way you sometimes do with a really big book. And this is a 600 plus page brick. Opera singer Lillier Byrne is the toast of Paris. She's been offered the lead role in an opera written specifically for her by a mysterious composer. She's only too happy to accept, but when she reads the opera, she finds that it is the story of her secret hidden past. There are only four people in the world who could possibly know her secrets, and it becomes a story of discovery, trying to figure out who betrayed her and what their possible motives could have been. From there, we flash back to her humble beginnings as a Minnesota farm girl raised by strict religious parents, her subsequent escape to the circus, and then her travels across to Europe. In that time, she's adopted several names, including that of no less than two dead girls. She's been a prostitute, a prisoner, a seamstress, a spy, left for dead, bought and sold, and trained in the opera. This is Charlotte Bronte writing Jason Bourne. There's intrigue, death, grand escapes, and opulent settings, as well as appearances by Ivan Turgenev, George Sands, and of course Verdi, with lots of opera. And I mean, as far as literature is concerned, if romance is a few streets away from my wheelhouse, as far as music is concerned, opera is a transatlantic flight away. But now I find myself listening to opera at work. It turns out even better than ambient electronica for getting work done. And I've even had a chance to see an opera at the symphony recently, Die Flader Mouse. It's probably the poppiest of all operas, and this version I saw was translated into English, but I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. I mean, prior to that, my only experience with Die Flader Mouse was the superhero in the Tick universe. This is a big deal for me because this is the first book I've ever received from a publisher that I've requested. Now, it's not the first book that I've requested. That would be Han Kang's Human Acts, which isn't available here in Canada. So I reached out to Portobello Books to plead my case and my desire to read more Korean authors. And surprisingly enough, they're only too happy to comply. Now, this was all prompted by Simon & Schuster Canada, who reached out to me and asked if I'd like an advanced reader copy of Anne Y.K. Che's K's Lucky Coin Variety. Now, Anne is a Toronto-based Korean writer, and I thought that was a wonderful narrowing on the part of the publisher. After hearing horror stories from other booktubers about publisher form letters that are directed to them and clearly having no idea what kind of readers they are. And it's strange for me because this means I've stepped over into new territory, and I don't know how that's exactly happened. Maybe it's having more than a thousand subscribers, or I've seen on other sites where they demand that you have at least a thousand Twitter followers before they'll even consider sending out a copy. Of course, books are looking for exposure, but I only like reviewing books that I enjoyed on this channel, which means there's a whole host of books that never get mentioned. And now I see how book hauls and unboxings might satisfy publisher requirements. There doesn't seem to be any hard and fast rules here, so I'm curious what you guys are doing and how you're navigating this area. Publishers, if you're watching, what are you looking for from booktubers and subsequently readers? This seems worthy of a video discussion. If you have questions that I haven't even thought to ask, or you have some input or feedback, I'd love to hear it in the comments below. Let me know. Anyway, I hope you have a great reading week, and we'll talk to you later.